Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video, which as usual features the contents of a large heavy box. Okay, and here is one uh, as described, so let's get it open and see what our challenge is for the next week or two. Well, it looks like we have the old box in a box trick, and I'm not sure how to proceed, but oh, wait a minute, let's open this panel. Well, this is exciting. It looks like we have a wooden framed crate uh, containing our chassis and probably reverb tank and other parts and the letter uh, from the owner. So uh, I guess I'm going to have to pull some more panels uh, to try to slide the chassis out the side of this uh, massive construction. Well, I've got most of the stuff out of the way. I have here what I think is the box containing all the tubes. Probably the reverb tank, very securely wrapped. A tasty uh, package here of kitty treats, owner's letter, and a succulent rainbow trout for dinner uh, with some green leafy substance that I hope is catnip to uh, make it even more uh, enticing. And I might share this with the cats, we'll see. But meanwhile, this jewel is actually screwed down to the wood frame of the crate. So let me uh, unscrew those very large uh, retaining screws and get this jewel out. Okay, the Torx head screws are uh, removed from both ends of the amp uh, and I'm going to slide it out of the crate. And lo and behold, we have a 1967 Vibrolux Reverb Amp with a gorgeous control panel, one change knob. As you can see, the script is a little different, a little different color, and the screw is at 1 instead of at 10. Okay, let's take a look inside, and you see this one's been worked on. All new cathode bypass caps. Looks to me like a uh, new power transformer and um, well I'm not so sure about the output transformer we'll see um, way overheated uh, screen resistors and grid blockers that you think would contribute maybe some noise everything else looks really nice and clean though I don't agree with how the power transformer primary is wired at all. One leads from the on off switch and one is from the fuse not the hot setup in my book. Okay so uh, we've seen the innards and obviously it's been worked on. I'm thinking this has probably been worked on and uh, still was not satisfactory. So your old uncle inherited the problem uh, so I kind of like a challenge. Uh, let's take a look at the rest of the chassis and then we'll get started. The rear control panel is spectacularly nice. This amp, other than the alterations that have occurred, doesn't look like it's been used that much. Um, if you look here on top, there is no evidence of heat. A um, couple things that make me a little nervous. Number one, this really sticks out. Uh, the output transformer may have been changed. I'm going to have to do some checking on that, but you got to admit, that really doesn't fit in with the pristine nature of the rest of the amp. And this is a little too pristine. I have no doubt then that we have a replaced power transformer. So, uh, filter choke at least uh, looks original. Um, well, it looks like we've got a spectacularly nice 67 Vibrolux Reverb that is going to be one of those challenges to make it sound right which is um, a little abstract okay we you know you can go through and replace bad caps and bad resistors but but hunting down the obscure components that make noise and distortion and all can be a tiring process but like I said I guess that's why it's here because uh, I'm one of the few people 
uh, silly enough to spend the weeks it might take to track all that down. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get started by reading the owner's letter. Oh, and before we take a look at that letter, uh, let's remove the doghouse cover, which is in real nice shape. And we see that the electrolytics have been replaced with a 16 microfarad at 475 volt F and T's. Okay, so uh, so far so good. Uh, it looks like pretty good work's been done. Uh, but you know how it is with these internodal resistors. We have to check them. And uh, odds are it's a resistor problem with this one rather than a capacitor problem since all the caps look new. Okay, so time to read that letter. And here we go. 67 Vibralux Reverb. A couple people do some work, as we saw. Electrolytics have been replaced, death cap removed, a grounded power cable installed, and not in the proper manner, I don't think. I'm going to change that. A few problems. Here we go. Some of the pots are a bit scratchy, and the amp is fairly noisy. It also takes a few minutes for the tremolo to start after clicking the foot switch. After it finally does start, it will start pretty much instantly from then on. Lagging initial startup. Okay, uh, I think a whole lot of us suffer from that. The bug uh, and tremolo related caps have been replaced. Amp blows a fuse every once in a while, never a good sign. Um, he suspects it's the resistors, which sounds uh, pretty logical from what I've read online. 67 was a bad year for resistors for Fender. I haven't ever heard that, but we'll see. Okay, here are the tubes. It looks like we go from the ridiculous to the sublime. Okay, that makes me nervous. No markings. Any tube that doesn't have any markings on it, it's like a, playing Russian roulette. God knows what it really is. Uh, we'll see. Oh, and here's a nice little note. Mr. Mario, I guess that's his kitty. Remember, there were the kitty toys and treats sent. Um, okay, Mario's a rescue cat. Pretty banged up. Missing an eye. Good God, his jaw was broken and reset. Missing a few teeth. Geez, once again, this sounds very familiar. Tongue hangs out, and he has a tendency to drool. Jeez, it's like somebody's been uh, peeking in my window. Okay, fits right in around here, no kidding. Okay, so we know uh, what we're up against. This is a different challenge than uh, most. Uh, most, it's an overhaul, and in this case, the overhaul is already done, but uh, the patient uh, still coughs and chokes and um, has other issues that we're going to have to look into. So this one will be somewhat of a challenge but then again a lot of amps have similar issues so this may be instructive for those of you who have similar issues with your amps maybe to help you uh, track down both the methods and uh, the uh, what we find might help you uh, in tracking down those issues with your amp so let's get started let's take a look at the output transformer I tightened the two screws now it's firmly attached to the chassis we see that it is a post CBS number 022848, which by coincidence is identical to the output transformer that I just installed in the Vibroverb in the video that preceded this one. Now those of you who saw that video will recall that the output transformer looked just like this. All sorts of discoloration, uh, rust, corrosion, and the like and uh, therefore apparently uh, they look like this okay so this seems perfect and one other thing uh, that we see that supports that conclusion besides Mitzi coming to join us here on the workbench is that we have the 606 Schumacher EIA code and we see that uh, this transformer was made in the 42nd week of uh, 1966 which would go along exactly with a 1967 manufacturing date so uh, even though this output transformer stands out like a sore thumb uh, I believe it's the original one that came on the end 
Next, let's take a look at the power transformer, which is obviously brand new. Uh, it has the flux band on both sides and an EIA code of 989, which tells us that it was made by Marvel Electric Corporation, known more commonly by the name Magnetic Components, and even more uh, commonly known as Classic Tone transformers. So we know Classic Tone's gone out of business which is really sad but before they did they made this jewel and uh, it is their model 1340 power transformer. The filter choke and the uh, reverb tank driver are both original. Now before I start uh, let's do a brief historical review of the Vibrolux reverb amp. They were built from 1964 to 1982, so it was a very successful model. What's that, 18 years? Um, for Fender, if you remember in the Vibroverb, uh, uh, in the previous video, uh, they barely finished one year with it, with only 500 of them being made. Okay, it's uh, of all the 6L6 Fender amps, this one is the lowest wattage and smallest size. It originally came in combo amp form with two 10-inch speakers and uh, it also featured three different circuits. Okay, a AA964, AA864, and an AB568 from the period of 64 to 67. So this particular amp could be any one of these three and we'll have to figure out which one it is. Okay, uh, also one last little tidbit is um, a, a music magazine uh, had a poll, I'm not sure when, probably many years ago, and the uh, Vibrolux Reverb was selected as the most uh, preferred low wattage Fender amp. To me it's not low wattage, um, 35 watts would make you right uh, in the middle of like a moderate uh, wattage, but anyway, it uh, apparently uh, has always been a very popular amp for Fender. I did some research on the internet and I think I found us a workable schematic uh, for this amplifier. I could not find a AA864 and the AB568 was a post CBS circuit with all sorts of added nonsense. I think this is going to work just fine for us. You know, people contact me all the time and say, hey, uh, do you happen to have a schematic for a, a you know, a, a Lester Schlub 982? And I don't. I don't keep a bunch of schematics, you know, uh, in a separate room at my house, like a library. I just download them as I need them. Uh, granted, I have schematics for all the uh, Fender amps, but they're the same ones that you can get by downloading on the internet. So uh, please don't uh, feel obligated to contact me if you can't find a schematic because honest I probably couldn't find it either. Okay that said let's get back to work. Well uh, first off before I uh, put the doghouse cover back on for safety I've checked the values of the two internodal resistors and sure enough they have drifted upwards a shade over 20 percent each Okay, so I think it's time to replace them with some uh, metal uh, oxide resistors and then we can put the doghouse cover on, flip this over and start on the uh, circuit that's within the chassis. Those old uh, internodal resistors are removed. You can see uh, definitely some heat uh, issues and why you wonder do these things get noisy as they get old. Well, since they're carbon composition resistors, imagine that there's a little trail of carbon through the center of this. I picture it as like a piece of pencil lead, a very small diameter, and the resistance is contained within the diameter and composition of that uh, uh, material, that carbon material that's uh, through the center. Now imagine, if you will, that over time, little cracks form in that line of carbon. Um, you, little fractures and uh, you can imagine then as the uh, the uh, electricity or current starts to come in one end uh, it's going to have to jump across those open spots and in so doing will make pops and crackles and sizzles and other noises till it gets out uh, this end and then it goes uh, to the next resistor. So uh, carbon comp resistors are a great source 
of that pop crackle sizzle kind of sound that you hear in a lot of these old amps that use the carbon comp resistors so uh, they're always suspect in a case like this and there we have the two internodal resistors installed and now it's time to uh, reattach the doghouse cover and to further demonstrate the superiority of these metal based resistors uh, you want 10,000 ohms by George you get exactly 10,000 ohms these things are ultra precise also they uh, resist heat and current flow very well so that they uh, keep their value over a long period of time they're way superior to any carbon based resistors so you ask if they're so vastly superior why don't we replace every resistor in the circuit with uh, metal film resistors or metal oxide resistors and um, it's simply because uh, the purists feel that these uh, yield too sterile of a tone and that the carbon based resistors uh, yield a more uh, vintage style of tone whether that's true or not I don't know exactly but I just know that I'm going to uh, leave every carbon based resistor I can in the circuit that checks out properly and only replace those that don't. Now let's move on to the crusty old screen and grid blocker resistors. As I was removing one of the uh, screen resistors it just fell apart which doesn't speak very highly of its uh, condition but uh, if you look down the center you can see the little uh, carbon track that I was talking about. Um, it reminds me of a firecracker with the powder down the center and I think the end results about the same when there's breaks in that carbon path you can imagine the little arcs and pops and sizzles that would be injected into the signal. The new screen and grid blocker resistors are installed and I'm going to bet that they're responsible for probably 80 to 90 percent of the background noise that the owner was complaining about. Uh, of course we'll see uh, during the audio test but uh, the resistors I removed were in terrible condition both electrically and physically. As expected a bunch of the carbon comp resistors are testing out of uh, acceptable limits. In this case we see it's 2.2K and you see it's 2.86. Now, uh, I think the reason that they drift upward is, as I mentioned before, those little breaks that occur in the carbon uh, trail that's inside the resistor, uh, I think that the amount of upward drift in the resistance value is probably a pretty good indicator of how many of those little breaches there are and therefore how noisy that resistor uh, has become. So uh, just to cut down the noise floor in this amp we're going to have to uh, replace all of the carbon comp resistors that have drifted way out of spec like this one. Here is Uncle Doug's cautionary tip number 9471. When replacing components don't trust their value okay just because they're new doesn't mean that the value is correct in this case we have two identical brown black yellow or 100k resistors the right one measures exactly 100k the left one however measures 147.8k okay so uh, it'd be a real shame to install this in the circuit and then try to track it down later as to what's causing the trouble so this one gets filed in the circular uh, trash pail and this one gets installed. It turns out that uh, five of seven of the cathode bias resistors for the 12A series tubes were all way out of spec. Now why is that uh, so critical? Well that's what's biasing your preamp tubes um, and your uh, reverb and tremolo tubes and if you don't have them biased correctly the, sound, uh, the amp is not going to sound or function properly so the bias of these tubes is every bit as important as the bias of the two output tubes now with all the resistors tested and of the bad ones replaced it's time to rewire the primary circuit 
the negative DC bias apply has been overhauled and the primary winding has been rewired uh, in a, a more appropriate uh, circuit pattern. The final step will be to convert the polarity switch into a negative NFB loop then we'll be ready to plug in some tubes and start audio testing this gem. While I was moving some wires around look what I discovered flapping in the breeze. That's the kind of uh, problem that can drive you nuts trying to track it down but uh, fortunately now I can resolder it and avoid that indignity. The switchable NFB loop is completed and now it's time to flip over the chassis plug in some tubes and power this uh, rascal up. I'm plugging in the tubes we have a GZ34 from JJ tubes we have a matched pair of JJ606 GC's and uh, as far as the 12A series tubes um, we've got a I'm not, I really wasn't familiar with this a 4024 which is a 12A T7 and a Telefunk in 12AT7 so they'll go into positions 3 and 6 we've got a Sylvania 7025 which is way too good to waste as an oscillator tube for the tremolo let's move it up here to the normal channel preamp position the two JJ 12AX7s let's use them as the uh, one of them as the tremolo oscillator and the other as the uh, reverb recovery tube and then finally we have V4 which just as we were led to expect has no markings at all on it looks like a 12AX7 to me but I don't want to roll the dice uh, I'm gonna go into my tube stash and find a nice clearly marked 12AX7 uh, to plug into uh, position 2 which will be the preamp tube for our vibrato channel well as usual we're plugged into the current limiter uh, speaker I was plugged into the shop 12 inch 8 ohm uh, speaker. The uh, Eurotubes probes are in series with the two output 6L6s. We're inputting a 200 cycle per second tone into the normal channel. I have the power on and I'm going to take it off standby in just a second and we'll see what happens. Okay, we're off of standby. Uh, no glow from the bulb. I do feel a little heat. Okay, we're drawing a, a bit of current as you might expect. Tubes are all lit up. Uh, let's see what kind of tone we're getting from our input signal. Boy, it sounds pretty. Sounds really nice to me. Let's turn down the volume and go listen to the speaker. Doesn't sound very noisy to me. In fact, if I weren't this close to the speaker, I wouldn't even be able to tell it was on. Okay, so we may have solved the noisy issue. Uh, let's take a look here at our output tubes. The matching is not that great. And uh, the uh, plate current's a little low. So uh, we can address that and uh, see if we can't figure out a way to, to get these better matched. Uh, I'd rather not have to order another set of tubes. Okay, so let's try the vibrato channel now. Okay, we're plugged into the vibrato channel. Once again, nice, nice smooth tone. Let's go over to the speaker. About as quiet as it gets. And uh, let's, I put in a dummy pedal for the tremolo. Let's see what happens with the tremolo. Well, it's kind of shallow and I'll be honest with you, the first time I turned it on it didn't it took forever to come on. What he's saying is true. I think there's an issue in the tremolo circuit that we'll have to address. But it's very slow to initiate the oscillation. Okay, uh, let's plug in the reverb tank 
and see if we can get any reverbing. Got the reverb tank plugged in and uh, turned it up to about five. And let's see. Oh man. Well, we know at least that the output portion of the reverb tank is working. We'll have to check the input portion and the overall quality of the reverb uh, tone. But uh, meanwhile, it looks like the amp is dead quiet. The controls are not scratchy or noisy. Uh, that uh, we have a weak, wimpy, kind of lazy and slow starting uh, tremolo, which will be the next thing to address. Now to check if the mismatch in the output tubes is the tubes or the socket. Might be something uh, wrong in the circuit. Um, so I uh, remember that uh, the way the tubes were before, we had 36.9 plate current on the left, 31.9 milliamps on the right. Okay, well I've reversed the tubes. Now when I take it off a of standby, let's see if that number changes. And sure enough, the low value followed the tube. This particular tube here was 31.9 when it was in this position, 31.9 now. So it's uh, this particular tube, the left one, uh, just simply cannot um, flow the same amount of current as the right one. Okay, we'll have to see how that mismatch affects our tone. We know that a serious mismatch in your output tubes can cause a hum because there's no cancellation uh, in the output transformer. So um, I don't hear any hum, so you might get away with this amount of mismatch. It's worth mentioning that there is a school of thought that holds that a mismatch in the output tubes that does not produce the uncancelled 60 cycle hum uh, can actually increase the percentage of even order harmonics and thus sweeten up the tone of the amplifier. So let's withhold our judgment on uh, this mismatched pair of output tubes until we've heard them in action during the audio demonstration and uh, see uh, if they produce a, a nice a pleasant tone and if so we'll leave them intact. Now step one in troubleshooting that kind of slow and shallow tremolo. Um, let's start off by double checking the values of each of the components in the oscillator circuit which will include the 2.01 and the 0.02 microfarad uh, oscillation capacitors and the resistors in between them. Let's start off with this one meg resistor and we see that it is well within uh, acceptable specifications. Let's move on to the other resistors. The second one is even better. And finally the 2.2 meg ohm resistor is it's a little high and also you notice I had to remove one end of it from the eyelet board because I was getting really just silly low readings and uh, it turns out that it was in parallel with another resistor on the board so uh, sometimes you have to uh, lift up one of the leads to get an accurate reading on your resistors. Now let's check the three capacitors in the oscillation loop. This is the 0.02 microfarad cap. We see that it is, if you imagine a decimal point right here, 0.0187 which is uh, about 6% low, but it's well within the plus or minus 10% leeway that we usually grant. Now the second uh, capacitor, which is a 0.01 microfarad, we see that it is uh, within about 6.2% of uh, being right on the money, so that's close enough. And the third uh, and final 0.01 microfarad cap is uh, within about 5% uh, of uh, specification. So once again, it is acceptable. Once you have eliminated out-of-spec components in the oscillation loop as the culprit for a weak or slow starting tremolo, we have to then start substituting oscillation tubes. 
Okay, and I will do that, and let's see if we can't find an oscillator tube that works better than the one we have. Now, as we recall, the original oscillator tube that came with the amp, which is V4, had no markings, and uh, I didn't want to use it, I didn't trust it, so I grabbed uh, one of my 12AX7s off the shelf and used it instead. Maybe I grabbed a weak one, okay, so I'm going to go grab a couple more, and we'll experiment and we'll try to find a better functioning oscillator tube. All right, I plugged in a different 12AX7 oscillator tube. Uh, we've got our a signal generator sending in 200 uh, hertz to a vibrato channel. Okay, let me take the amp off of standby. And we have our tone. Now, before I did all this, I removed my uh, shorting jack that simulates a uh, the foot switch turning the tremolo on. Okay, the shorted position is what turns the tremolo on. Let's plug it in and see if the tremolo will start. And it does. Starts instantly. Now let's check the depth. Speed. That's pretty slow. Kind of fades out at about four. So it looks like we have to have our tremolo set to at least four for it to start oscillation. Maybe three and a half. Okay, but that tremolo sounds pretty good to me. And it obviously starts very quickly. Okay, I think then by substituting our oscillator tubes, we've come up with a usable tremolo. Once again, the final test is always when we're doing our audio check. Also, it should be noted on our tremolo that there is no beat heard through the speaker, even at a high intensity level. Sometimes with the opto isolator type of tremolo, you'll hear a thump, 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 thump in the background, um, especially at a high intensity level. But in this case, our tremolo has absolutely none of that annoying background noise. Now let's move on to one other issue I noticed while I was testing the reverb tank earlier, and that is when the reverb is turned on, uh, we're starting to get some hum. And what that usually comes from is uh, improperly shielded or grounded leads running from the amp to the reverb tank and back. And let's face it, this is a giant antenna for noise. And if your shielding is not optimum on these two long cables, uh, you're going to have a whole lot of home. So let's uh, see if it still does that. Uh, maybe it was the routing of the cables before that uh, pr uh, created the hum. Uh, let's get them routed away from the amplifier as they'd be in the cabinet and uh, turn on our reverb and see if we can hear a hum that responds to the reverb intensity control. Okay, I've got the volume turned up to a reasonable level. Uh, let's crank up our reverb and see if we can hear that hum. Now I don't. That sounds fine. I hear no hum as a result of the reverb intensity. Well, let's see here. If I get up to 10, I can hear a little bit of a hum. Okay, but let's face it, at 10, uh, reverb hum is the least of your worries. Okay, so at 7, there is no reverb hum. So I think it was the routing of the cables, but uh, just because that solved the issue in this case, you may have to double check and be sure that your shields are grounded to the 
uh, little uh, jacks, the outer casing on the plug, be sure that those uh, shields are grounded, okay, so that your shielding is intact and protects this long signal carrying wire that goes to the reverb and back um, does not pick up extraneous noise. Well, I think we solved all the problems that the owner commented on. We've eliminated any kind of background noise. It's, the amp is dead quiet. The tremolo now has a decent intensity and also um, it starts promptly when you step on the foot switch. Uh, the reverb uh, works beautifully with no background hum associated with the intensity setting. Um, and we're going to double check on those slightly mismatched output tubes by listening closely to the audio demo, which I think should start right now. Okay, I'm going to flip this over. We'll get all in jack all tuned up. And let's uh, strum some uh, tunes to this jewel and see how it sounds. We'll try both the normal and the vibrato channels clean, and then we will try some tunes with reverb, then with tremolo, and then with both. Okay, so uh, pull up an easy chair, grab a beer, and let's get ready for our uh, audio demo.
Well, I guess that's about it for this stellar video on the 1967 Vibrolux Reverb Amp. The guitar that was used in the audio demo was a custom-built Fender Stratocaster with P90 pickups. 
I had intended to uh, show it to you in the video but Ollie and Jack locked it up in the vault before I could do that and they're off on a catnip binge. So I guess all that's left to say is thanks for joining us. We want to express our appreciation to all our PayPal contributors and Patreon patrons for their generous support of our channel and keeping us on the air uh, and advertising free as far as we're concerned for another month. If you would like to join them in supporting our channel, we would really appreciate it and I've included links in the video description which will allow you to do so. Also be sure to subscribe to our channel if you have not already done so, so that you'll receive notification each time we post a new video. I want to give you a little teaser. Our next video is going to be a total change of pace something completely off the wall. I think you'll really enjoy it, uh, I hope, and uh, just that you will join us and give it a chance. Okay, so we're going to see you probably uh, around the middle of next month. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy, stay happy, and stay tuned in. Thanks so much. Bye for now.